Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight on this lovely autumn evening. <laughs> My name is Rob Crawford. I work here at Faith School. I'm also a parent of three Faith students. Many of you I see are also face, uh, parents of Faith students, and you know the school well. But for those of you who may not be as familiar with us, Faith has been around for 148 years. We are a co-ed independent school for children in grades pre-K through grade 9. Most of our students are day students from about 30 metro west towns, but we also have 127 day and 5 day boarders in grades 7 through 9. And these students come from about 10 US states and 17 countries around the world. I could, as a parent, go on and on about our small class sizes and our amazing teachers, but the five signs above me here really say it all. These are the school's five core values. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Faith School, please join us at our admission open house on Sunday, December 7th. You can also pick up more information here at this table as you exit. Uh, tonight, we kick off our Ideas and Insights at Faith School Speaker Series. And I want to take this opportunity to thank my colleague, Nicole Casey, for organizing and publicizing this speaker series. I also uh, want to follow her strict instructions to invite you to our second speaker event on February 11th when Katie Greer from KL Greer Consulting will talk about internet safety for kids. I also want to take the, a moment to thank uh, Southboro Access Media for filming tonight's event for their cable channel. We are very honored to welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Nancy Carlson Page. Nancy is the author of the highly touted book, Taking Back Childhood, A Proven Roadmap for Raising Confident, Creative Kids. She is a child development expert, a parent herself of confident, creative kids, and professor emerita at Lesley University. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Carlson Page. Hi everyone, thank you for that nice introduction. It's really good to be here, especially after the hair-raising drive of getting here. It's especially good and thank you for coming because I'm sure there must have been that little feeling of, ooh, it's raining and I could just stay home and stay dry. So thanks for coming out for this talk and um, I hope that it's, it's worthwhile for you. Um, I'm gonna talk for about an hour and then we'll have questions um, and comments, but um, while I am talking, if something um, occurs to you that feels like you really want to bring it up right then, it's a question or a comment that feels pressing, um, raise your hand and we can, you know, be a little flexible about that. So um, here's how I'd like to um, start, um, asking you to think about when you were a child and when you would come home after school, you know, how you would get home from school and then uh, picture of the school you went to, it can be any grade that you, that comes to mind, and the town you lived in, the house you lived in at the time that this is coming up for you. And just um, think for a minute, how did you spend your time outside of school? And then would you um, find someone next to you, or you might have to be creative, might be behind you, to talk for a few minutes about how you spent your time? as a child outside of school. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that a nice way to be interrupted? Oh, can you hear me when I'm talking out of this? Yes. Okay. All right, let's, let's hear from some of you. Would you raise your hand and, and say out to the rest of us what you were saying to your partner? Someone? How, yes. Um, I spent a majority of my childhood playing outside. Playing outside. Backwoods with the neighborhood kids. Backwoods with the neighborhood kids. Mm -hmm. Same. 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 Others? Yes. I'd run into the house, grab a cookie, change my clothes, and run outside. Yeah. <laughs> So there's quite a bit of common ground among us, quite a bit of shared childhood experience, um, some diversity in it, but also a lot of shared childhood experience. So let's think for a minute now about the children in your life now, and how are they spending 
their time outside of school. Can you, um, what comes to mind? Just put your hand up. What? Yes. Videos and cell phones. What was the first thing? Screen. Screens, yes. videos, and cell phones. Yes. We spend a lot of time in our car. A lot of time in the car and on screens, and a lot of times there are screens in the car. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Supervision. I'll always know where they are, what they're doing, who, you know, who's accountable to watch my kids. They're not riding a horse for three hours without a cell phone. We always know where they are and what they're doing, and we're and we've been accused of being helicopter parents. But um, so we can see just among us, there's been a dramatic change in the culture of childhood in one generation. And the social forces that are impacting childhood have changed dramatically. And that's what we're talking about tonight. And that's what, what I really want to share with you. My background is in child development and um, that's the field I've studied and done research in extensively. So that is my perspective. I know a lot of theory and research in child development, and that's a lot of what, what concerns me, is to uh, notice what these new influences are, how they're impacting children, and then hopefully when we become more aware of, of, of um, effects on kids that don't look so healthy, to think about what we can do to kind of restore healthier lives for them. So um, one of the big influences we, we first mentioned, and um, oh, now I can go to this one. Oh, yeah, I've got two mics. <laughs> I can get it out of my hand, which is really nice. Um, so one of the um, first um, societal influences we've acknowledged um, is the influence of media and technology, screen, screen time, and how profoundly influential that has become. You know, in such a short period of time, technology and media have just cascaded into our lives and into children's lives so quickly we've had very little time really to reflect on it and not nearly enough time to do, um, to do the research on it that needs to be done. Um, for, for a number of years, a lot of us uh, were concerned about the amount of television children were watching, and many of us still are, doctors and educators, psychologists, because studies show that um, children watch many, many hours of television. Um, still, the age group two to five watching 4.5 hours of, of TV every day on average. And even though the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no screen time before the age of two because of concerns about brain development, the brain's developing very, very rapidly from birth and through the early childhood years. Um, and then they recommend an hour or so of screen time after, after the age of two. Um, but ch the reality is that kids are, are watching um, much more television than that, though things now are changing very much because, as you well know, kids can watch shows on, um, on, on what? Okay. iPads, computers. I, you know, um, I have seven grandkids and I'm around children all the time because I'm with them, I'm with their friends, and I have an iPhone well, one of the issues I want to sort of underscore is that technology for us as adults isn't the same as it is for kids. And I, I'm talking about the influences on kids. I'm, it's going to, might sound to you like I'm anti-technology, but I understand it's offered so many um, opportunities for us, for our own growth as a society and as citizens and as informed people. But for children, it's, it's a different thing, so we have to kind of separate that out. But when I'm around... Um, my granddaughters, for example, if I put my iPhone or my husband Doug puts his iPhone on the table, uh, we turn around and one of them, Isabella's downloaded four games, you know, <laughs> before we even can realize she has it in her hand. She's, they're all very facile and they know what they like and um, one of the issues is that um, kids get hooked really fast on technology. It's very compelling for them. So what do we know actually from research about the influence of technology? Um, one of the problems is that we don't know enough. And one of the things about our society is that it is legal to market things, sell things, 
before we've done thorough studies or longitudinal research on their effects on children. That, that's a problem. That doesn't happen in all European countries. It's, it's the way marketing happens in the United States. So we do know, the studies we have do raise concern. They show that um, a lot of screen time um, correlates with sleep disturbances and correlates with distractibility and impedes deeper thinking and in some cases empathy and um, lots of screen time and screen time is generally habituating um, you know children the more they um, engage with screens the more they want to and studies show that if the more screen time children had before the age of three then the more they have when they're older and the more difficult it is for them to disengage so um, we need much more research but um, what we do know certainly um, raises um, questions for us meantime I would say across the society we have kids you know engaged with um, screens for hours every day and yet we, we really don't know um, what the long-term effects of these things are and unfortunately there isn't any regulation the, the Federal Trade Commission used to regulate marketing to children in the United States and then they were going to make that stricter and corporations lobbied to take away their right to do that and succeeded in Congress so the FTC lost its um, authority to regulate marketing to children. So basically it's a free-for-all now because anybody can market anything. If you want to market a product and make a claim on it, you can. Um, for quite a few years, Brainy Baby videos and Baby Einstein videos were very, very popular. People were, maybe some of you bought them. I've certainly had so many parents tell me that they thought they were doing the right thing by showing their baby these videos because all the marketing from the Disney Corporation claimed that they had educational value. And um, I'm part of an advocacy group that actually took a case to the federal, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, um, because um, those were false claims. There isn't any research whatsoever to show that there's any educational benefit to looking at videos in the first year of life. And in fact, there's uh, questions about impeded um, language development and other kinds of harm that um, and so it was a very nasty awful court fight but ultimately um, it was decided um, against the Disney Corporation and they had to withdraw the education claims which they did and they had to offer refunds for anybody who had bought the uh, the baby videos I don't know if you know that but um, it was it was a little David and Goliath story <laughs> because it was a small advocacy group you know making this claim but it sort of gives you an example too of wow if if that group hadn't done that um, there'd still be mass marketing in in a much more aggressive way of of baby videos and um, on the heels of that we have um, Fisher Price's new activity seat which is an iPad for an infant connected to the the baby seat and um, here's the thing. I, I would like to raise some concerns about um, where we're at with, with all of this, because one of them has to do with we don't have enough research. And another concern has to do with um, respecting and understanding how children learn. And um, one of the kind of fundamental issues that goes on, when we, when we put babies, this is the activity seat once the kid can sit up. But when we put babies and toddlers um, in front of screens, it, it, there are many far-reaching effects and many things to talk about. But one of them is, has to do with how it affects their relationship to learning in, in a broad way. Maybe I can explain this with a story. When my son Kyle was uh, five months old, um, and that was 40-some years ago, <laughs> Um, I had, he was in a crib, an old rickety crib that we could afford, and I had put this little um, mobile over his, on the crib that hung over him that was little calico animals. You didn't even wind it up, it was just simple little animals that hung there. But he discovered that when he kicked his little baby feet, he could make the crib shake and the mobile would shake. 
So he would kick his feet, the mobile would shake, and he would laugh and laugh and laugh. And this would go on and on. I'd hear him in there laughing his head off because he deliberately would kick to, and understand that he was making those little animals shake. Well, that's an important thing because what it shows you actually is that, shows us is that he was making a causal connection between a physical behavior, an action, and a result, cause and effect. And you know, one of the amazing things about brain development is that it's through activities just like that. All the activities children have in the early years that the brain um, synapses are forming, that the neuronal connections occur as a result of the activity. So lots of activity in childhood is really essential for optimal brain development. So a, a few years ago, my younger son had a, a baby daughter, and uh, I went to see them when she was five months old. So the same age when Kyle had this mobile, and she had a, was given a mobile as a baby gift. So my younger son, Matt, said, Mom, could you look at this mobile? Because it's kind of weird. We, we turned it on, but Isabella looks really dazed by this mobile. So I went to look at it, and it was pretty incredible. It was a huge umbrella thing. You lay the baby on her back, and there's this huge umbrella thing hanging over her. And then you wind it up, it goes around, it had strobe lights <laughs> like this, and then it had all these shapes, checkers and different shapes moving all around, and loud music, <laughs> all playing. So I said, oh, no, that's definitely not, you know, not a good for her, and we got rid of it, and we didn't even give it away, <laughs> because we didn't want anyone else to have it. But, um, but the, a deeper point for me about that is that one of the influences of technology now in infancy and toddlerhood and the early childhood years is that all of the electronic toys and games and screen activities focus a child's attention outside of herself or himself. So that very idea of Kyle kicking and making that mobile shake as opposed to Isabella, a generation later, laying there passively to be entertained by the whirling things in front of her, to me is a profound idea that is a kind of an organizing idea for the effects of electronics and how they influence, let's say, initiative in a child. You know, when you watch, if you watch babies, they, they grab their toes, they try to put them in their mouth, they reach for a rattle, then they, they reach for a block and another rattle, and they bang them together. All of these activities are things a baby is initiating. And to the extent that we're putting them in front of activities that um, give them a lesson that, that new learning is actually entertainment, it's outside of you, and it's being done to you. You, you can be kind of passive, and it'll just happen. I think is a serious erosion of what I would call a long-term ability to develop um, a healthy, optimal learning process, which we ideally want for children. Um, another concern I have that's related is that, um, is that children learn um, best from direct experience. In the early, and I have so many disagreements with technology people, because technology people aren't early childhood educators, and we, we have a very hard time seeing eye to eye on this. Young children, all the decades of child development theory and neuroscience and research say the same thing, that children learn in the early years through direct experience, through hands-on activity, through manipulating objects, through their, all their senses fully engaged in the environment and with objects and with people. You know, when you look at something like this act activity, there's not an adult there. The, the adult's doing something else, probably on, probably on their iPhone. But, you know, it's a serious issue around relationships, human relationships that children need and how do they learn about being a caring person in relationship with others if we're plugging them into screens. Um, so um, I'm very uh, worried that children have less direct experience. The more they're engaged with screens, they have less direct experience. 
And um, here's an example, maybe, of, of, of what I mean. When you're looking at a screen, it's never direct experience. It's because what's on the screen is always a symbolic representation of something in the real world. So having an apple and manipulating the apple and putting your little mouth on it or your teeth on it and smelling it and rolling it is a different activity from an apple on a screen, which is a symbolic representation of an apple. And the learning is different, the brain synapse development is different, and the engagement of the senses and full um, learning potential is very different in those two activities. So um, here is uh, a Barbie computer. And this, this thing actually is an example of, of, the, of the many kinds of uh, math-related games that are on the market now that I see children playing with all the time. They, they do things like you hit a button and it says 2 plus 4 equals, and then you, you hit a, the correct or incorrect button, and it, it says good, or try again. So it's, it's a simple little math addition game, and a, a lot of parents... There's another one. I think there's a whole set of them. Are they called Leapfrog or something like that? There's, there's different lines of these kinds of electronic games. So a lot of parents will actually be fooled, if you will, into thinking their kid's a math whiz because they can, children can memorize these um, little formulas very easily and come up with the right answer without actually understanding um, numbers because let's say it said 2 plus 3 e equals, and let's say a child's played that over and over again, so she understands that it's 5 and she's hitting the right button and the, and the machine has taught her how to do that. But what does it mean to actually understand what is the number 5? And how do children come to understand it? And when they're manipulating materials in, through direct experience, let's say blocks, the way they come to understand 5 or six, or four, is through arranging blocks in different shapes. Let's say you've got five blocks. If you make them into a boat, and then you stack them, and then you put them in a line, um, you come to understand the fiveness of them because you understand that no matter how they're arranged, it's still the number five. And that's really a very abstract concept that children have to learn through um, actions on materials. That is, if you had five elephants and five ducks and five pennies, they all look very different. So to understand that they're five, the fiveness of them is, is something you have to actually mentally abstract from the material to understand there's, there's something unifying to those configurations of objects. And that takes a long time for children to do, but the way that they come to understand it is through years, actually, in early years of this kind of manipulation of all kinds of materials. And to the extent that the use of screens is bypassing first-hand experience with materials, and it certainly is, I think we're running a big risk in terms of not laying the full foundation for building concepts in the early years that we need to be doing with children and that um, is optimal for them. So I'm concerned about this. Um, this issue of bypassing uh, um, foundational building of concepts in the early years cognitively, but also um, I'm concerned about it um, socially and emotionally <laughs> because the reality is, um, and, and the reality is this, giving kids an iPhone to play with apps, giving them iPads, all that stuff makes parenting a boatload easier. And if you're tired and you just don't want to deal, it's so easy. And it's an option I never had when I had young kids, but I have grandkids now and I see how easy it is to reach for that assistance. And, you know, so feeling guilty about doing it doesn't get us anywhere. I'm just trying to get us to think more about when we use it and how we use it. Because there's a danger here in bypassing more than just cognitive um, concepts. Um, I was with a family last summer, and the uh, grandmother was leaving um, the five-year-old boy, who she's very, very close to, 
and he started to cry really, really hard, Nana, don't go, Nana, don't go. He was in a lot of separation pain. He's very close to his Nana, and they don't live in the same city. Um, and the parents uh, drew him away from that experience and, and showed him um, an, an iPhone game. They, they showed him a game and said, come and play with this game, Finn, and don't, you know, don't worry about that. And that's the exact kind of, you see, um, what he really needed and what would be uh, better uh, for him would be to actually be with those feelings, talk about being sad, um, say goodbye to, to Nana, and, and he's crying, and suggest, a, here's a piece of paper and some crayons. Can you draw a picture of what it feels like, what you're feeling? Can we see a picture of how you're feeling? or make a picture of saying goodbye to Nana, or some picture about this experience, and then we can talk about this experience, and then we can send the picture to Nana, and then we can make a calendar of how many days until we see Nana again. And these are the things many parents feel able to do and are able to do. It's very seductive to get out of these tricky, difficult, painful situations with an app. It's so easy, and it's a quick fix, and it looks like it works. But it really doesn't work in the long run, because if we do it too much, then we're not building, helping children build a foundation for, of experience to know how feelings feel, how we identify them, how we learn to cope, coming to know ourselves as someone who can cope because I've coped in this other experience and so I know I can cope in this next one. And, um, you know, all of the profound uh, aspects of emotional and social development that we could be bypassing if we're, um, if we're not careful. And um, I think that the, the use of the, of the piece of technology to help children cope in difficult situations and also to help them solve conflicts. This is another thing I've seen a lot when kids are fighting, is the parents will just say, go to your own room and watch, watch a video or, or watch a show, something you're fighting with your sister too much, go watch a show. But these things are all distractions from dealing with conflict and social and emotional issues rather than actually dealing with them, which, again, it's not like if you if you, if you um, never do it, 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 it's more doing it too much and not giving kids this, this opportunity um, to build this knowledge. You know, um, there's a lot of confusion in the country right now about even what learning is and what does it mean to know things all through early childhood and elementary school and high school. Things are very messed up in education right now. But you know, you don't just all of a sudden become a caring person at age 18. You, you, skills and awareness and self-reflection and self-understanding um, in all areas, in math, in science, in social areas, these build in a hand-over-hand -hand developmental way through life. So, it's hard sometimes because we're dealing, as parents especially, very difficult day-to-day -day issues. We're tired, we went to work, we're trying to make dinner, and the kid is screaming, and it's so easy to just get that over with and keep doing what we need to do, and it's hard to remember this long-term view of how children construct an understanding of, of ideas over time, over a whole lifetime of childhood when we're dealing in the immediate moment. I have to keep my eye on this time. Um, my watch broke today, so I borrowed my husband Doug's. <laughs> you can't miss it. It's like <laughs> great big, it's falling off, but it's working. Um, so another concern I have is, um, is the messages that come to kids uh, through media and technology. Um, because, you know, even a generation ago and two generations ago, the values that children learn, they learn from their family, from their community, maybe from church, or, but from people in their world. So it's a very big difference 
that kids now get messages about who they are and values about what it means to be a human from media, right? Because, and we know from research, like the more that little girls buy teen magazines and watch MTV and all that, that the less happy they are with themselves and with their own body and the more depressed they are and more likely to have eating disorders. These messages that are very gender specific start getting marketed to little girls and boys from a very young age. This is just an example of a Bratz doll. It could be a Barbie doll or many other kinds of dolls that are much more teenage -y and sexualized. It is funny, but it's also kind of loaded with messages about what, what am I as a girl? And what are the expectations of me? And of course, these messages all you know, pretty uniformly present females um, that look a certain way, that have a certain kind of hair, that have a certain kind of body type. And um, kids start to take this in, first subliminally, but they are taking it in um, increasingly in childhood and very much so by the time they're teens. Boys get heavy messages too, and of course girls and boys are seeing all these messages, just that marketers are appealing to girls and boys in different ways. They can sell more toys that way, and they're appealing to gender differences that they can kind of capitalize on, because girls and boys are interested in understanding that I'm a girl and I'm a boy and what is that. But the messages to boys, this is a, uh, marketed to, uh, Star Wars toys marketed to three-year-olds, are very um, much um, emphasizing um, Violence. Well, if you, let's say you see these toys, what, what do you think, what are the messages that, that these toys tell you about what kind of world you live in? Can, what? Violence. It's a violent world? Scary. Scary. Dangerous. dangerous. You have to be armed because it's dangerous. You should fight. You need to fight. If you have conflict with somebody, then what you need to do is fight to either win or lose, and so you have winners and losers in the world. And these messages are pretty much the steady stream of them. I have a colleague who's studied all of these themes in cartoons and themes that are toys that are marketed to boys, and they're all basically that same set of themes. Oh, you know why I do that? Because someone saw me give a talk one day and she said, you know, you're, you've got your back to that image, and you're talking away, and we have to look at it. <laughs> and after that, I thought, oh, I understand that, so I'm going to relieve you every time I can remember uh, with something more peaceful and pleasant than, than some of these images you're looking at. So here's another one I'm afraid is, um, do you know Call of Duty, the um, very popular video game? Um, Okay, how long do you want to look at this? No, okay, on to the beautiful photo of the sand and the rock. Um, but the, um, the, the problem, video games, there are many problems with them, but they are, because there are first person shooter games and kids are involved in actually committing the violence, they, they have a much deeper effect on, on the psyche and, um, that, and there's no regulation, as I said before, so studies show that very young kids can go in at least 50% of the time and buy an M-rated video game that is for age 17 and up. There's, there's no penalty for the retailer, or, and there's no controls whatsoever. All of this is very wrong in my opinion, but we have made no headway on it with the kind of Supreme Court we have now. But um, the all the major medical groups got together with and made one statement about um, entertainment violence, which was the American Medical Association, American Pediatric Association, all American Psychological Association. They joined together. They studied all the hundreds and hundreds of studies, and they put out one one call to saying um, one statement saying um, entertainment violence desensitizes children to violence and makes some children behave more violently, depending on other risk factors. But that idea of desensitizing to violence worries me very much, because that's the last thing I want to see in a, in a society, a, a healthy society, a society of citizens who care 
for each other and a society where we can care for one another and operate in a, some kind of a democratic way. And, um, you know, if you're desensitized, you're basically scared. You're, you're basically numbed out in order to protect yourself from seeing the violence. But um, that's something that we're seeing in children, we've been seeing in children for a long time, and as the amount of violence they're exposed to increases, we see it more and more. So another, um, another really, isn't this a depressing talk? <laughs> well, what am I gonna do? I don't know. We're gonna get to a more uplifting part at the end because there are things we can do, but you know, I'm just telling the truth so, as I see it. As I see it. If you don't agree with me, you can either tell me now or later. I'll, I'll listen. I honestly will. Um, so marketing to kids has become a huge industry. You must see that. that. Marketing to kids is everywhere. It's so pervasive. It's even in schools now, on school buses. Um, in, because you have a single theme like Cat in the Hat or Power Rangers or Star Wars, and then you have all these toys and products, um, that are marketed along with the media, hundreds of them really, sleeping bags, toothbrushes, everything, and all the princess stuff. <clears throat> That's what my granddaughters are into, Ariel and Disney princesses and all. Um, it really, um, the media acts as um, an advertisement for the toothbrush, and the toothbrush is an ad for the lunchbox, and on and on. And plus there are, you know, giveaways at fast food places, and it's pervasive the marketing. And that has been the true since the Reagan years. Before that, it was not legal to market toys and products along with media. That was a really good period of time. As my boys were growing up then, and they could watch an occasional Batman show on TV, but they didn't have 200 Batman products to saturate their poor little brains um, so that they could still think creatively and, and make up their own stories and think with imagination. But the more that we pummel kids with a single theme um, through all these different media venues, then the more their minds fill with it and the less they have their own ideas and their own creative thinking going on. I was in a second grade when the, um, the most recent Star Wars movie came out and there was a little boy who just sat at a table and said to other kids, Star Wars, I just can't get it out of my mind. You know, he just, it's all he could think of, it's all he could draw, it's all he could talk about. Um, merchandising is very um, heavy, so all these products, you know, children, research shows kids can't really distinguish between an ad and a TV show or understand what an ad is before the age of eight, um, roughly eight, because you, you have to understand when you see an ad, you know that someone's trying to sell you something. So you have to understand intention, and younger kids don't. I mean, that's one of the things that's so beautiful about them. And they're, they're, we say they're naive. Well, they're beautiful because they believe us, because they take things at face value. And I, I just love that about children. But they're not, you know, they're not questioning when they're little what your motive is or thinking that you're not being genuine. So I, I think it's, uh, it should be illegal to market. Um, I think it should be illegal to advertise to children under the age, I would say, ideally 12, which is the way it is in Sweden um, and some other countries, but at least the age of eight. But again, we don't have any regulations protecting children at all in the climate we're in now. And another way that these, um, all this media cross-feeding is influencing children is it's really undermining the quality of children's play. What do I mean by that? Well, if you see kids play like just ge with generic baby dolls like this, if you observe it, and I know there's some early childhood people here, you know, you know that the, they're very creative. They're like directors and writers and actors all at once. They, they bring their own experience in and they make up stories. No child's play ideally should look like any other child's play, although these days it does much more than we would ever want, but ideally every kid's play would look completely original. I had a little girl in a kindergarten class I taught many years ago, Sarah, who um, had a lot of separation issues with her mom. She was very sad when her mother would leave her off early and her mother went to a very high-pressured retail position. 
And we had dolls and a little business office set up in the play area, and Sarah would act out every morning, you know. She'd say goodbye to that doll, that baby, not that nice sometimes, I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, like shoving her aside and going to her office, you know, and getting on the phone. In those days, we had a, an, an actual old phone. Getting on the phone, calling people, doing all of her important things, you know, coming back home to her child. Um, but she played this out every morning for a long, long time. And Sarah's play, nobody else's play was like that. You know, she needed to do it. It was her particular issue with her mom and her own life experience and her imagination acting it out in that way. So here's just one example of the kinds of toys that get marketed to kids through these media themes. And this is, again, Bratz dolls. I know, but... What can I say? OK. But they're marketed to little girls. They look like teenagers. They come, here's the problem. They come with scripts. They come with names. They come with a storyline. They like to shop, and they have boyfriends. There's teenage interests, too. But if you watch little girls playing with the Bratz dolls um, or any other media tie-in toy, it could be Star Wars. It could be Spider-Man. I'm just using this as an example. But you will observe that the play is not as authentic and original and not meeting the needs of the child as deeply and fully as, um, as, as it does with, more, uh, with, with toys that are more generic and not uh, media linked. So that's one of the things we're dealing with is not only is play diminishing from kids' lives these days because they're on screens all the time, there's much less recess in schools, less play inside of schools by far, but um, also the quality of their play when they do get to play um, is often um, less holistic and, and less satisfying and meeting their deep developmental needs less well. Um, okay, so let's see where we are. So the other issue... Um, Oh, this is the Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood. This is the organization I work with. In case you don't know, they have a wonderful website. Um, your community might even be interested either in having um, someone fr from their group speak to you, or um, if you go on their website, there are free downloads. There are fact sheets about marketing, uh, marketing violence, sexism, uh, obesity, many kinds of um, issues that are all research-based, super interesting. Um, and also they have a PowerPoint that you can download that you could look at as a community. So I really recommend checking them out. So the other influence, and I didn't know if, if this community would want to hear about this influence, but in talking to a couple people before, I, I'm feeling more encouraged. And, and that is that um, this is a really dreadful period of time in the history of American public education. There is a, a phenomenal, as you probably know, increase in, um, in uh, a academics and testing, in accountability and in, in standards. And it's, it's having a, a really uh, serious effect in classrooms ac across the country. It's having an effect in private schools as well because it's it set a tone and it's, it's, it's communicating a set of expectations nationally that I think has scared a lot of private schools too. At least that's what I'm told and what I've observed. There are national standards now that are really, that were imposed from the top down and they're getting imposed across the country. And um, it, it's a long story, but basically it's a set of standards that are requiring children to learn specific skills at specific ages. This is always a problem uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's focusing a lot on content, like you're supposed to know this, 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 and this. Like a kindergartner should, kindergartner is supposed to know how to count to 100 by tens and to count backwards from 100. And, and um, if, you under, if you appreciate child development, you know that the age ranges for learning concepts in the early years especially, but actually throughout elementary school, are very big. So to expect all kids to be able to do something at a specific age is, um, 
is very, very unwise because there will be a lot of kids who actually don't understand what they're being asked to learn. And so they're genuinely trying, but they really don't get it. Um, and that kicks off then a whole lot of, I think, special ed issues and confusion on the part of the child, not to mention feelings of inadequacy. Uh, one mother just sent me this photo she took of the ditto sheets her kindergartner came home with just one day. Um, so there's an atmosphere um, in public schools of, um, of pressure, of academic pressure. There's much more direct teaching in kindergartners across, kindergartens across the country and even preschools because they have to try to um, prepare children for kindergarten now. And um, much more scripted curriculum so that the curriculum is much less play-based and experiential and therefore much less well meets the needs of, of all young children. I've visited many classrooms that have mandated uh, data walls. The, the teachers have to post the test scores of children. This is one kindergarten where the uh, reading scores were posted. Every child is assigned an animal and everybody knows what animal you are and then you um, you're, you're, you're ranked visually on the wall, and the teachers are required to, to have the data walls. So this is, this is just one photo, but there's rankings in math and, and uh, all kinds of literacy rankings. So um, the environment feels, um, it's scary to teachers. I think a lot of teachers are teaching these required uh, standards, even though they know, well, I know this because I uh, have a website and teachers write to me all the time. They know that it's not appropriate, but they're also afraid about their own job, and they've been told that they have to be teaching these things so the school can get decent test scores. So it's, it's really a vicious cycle. But um, it's not a surprise to me then that um, the only longitudinal study we have for creativity it's called the Torrance Test. It's, you might have heard of it, but it's been um, used for decades. And in recent time, we're seeing a big decline in creativity in children, especially young children. It's not really a surprise, given everything I've just said, that that would be the case. But I think it's alarming because, to me, what's healthy in a society is really people who can think out of the box, think in original ways, think creatively. Um, and I think that's connected also to being able to, to feel empathy. And, um, OK, so let's talk about some things we can do to reclaim a really healthy childhood for the children who are in our care and in our lives. Um, the first thing I would say is, um, harking back to the earlier discussion on technology, of course you're going to choose to use it sometimes. It's a given. It's here. It's here to stay. But I think if you can make a choice about when to use it and how to use it and be aware of, of some of the things we're talking about tonight, um, that would be great. Maybe you'll use it less. Maybe you'll find some creative ways to intervene other than using it. It's, it's, it's the quick and easy thing to, to reach for. But um, if we can ask ourselves, is there some other activity my child could be doing that meets the need of this moment, that is more creative and more engaging uh, for her or him, then let me see if I can think of it. Um, I think we should try to limit the media in our children's lives as much as we can. A lot of families tell me they have a really hard time with this. And I understand, like I said, my granddaughter Isabella with the grabbing the iPhone before I even know it. We have to really think about it. And I think we have to talk with them about it in a problem-solving kind of way. You know, I, I want to really talk with you about how much you're watching the screen and figure out how much screen time you can have. And let's figure it out together and let's make an agreement and, and we can keep revisiting it, but let's, let's really decide how much we want this in our lives and really try to be proactive with kids because it's a slippery slope. If we're not, they're just kind of doing it now all the time. And also to talk with them about the content of the media that they see. 
Um, one of the dangers of media, I'm sure you've noticed, is that kids are doing it on their own, and, and you're not, even in earlier times when you watched TV as a family, you would talk about a show. But when a kid has an iPad there and they're watching something all by themselves, you can't even make a comment or ask a question or have a dialogue about what they're seeing. Um, one of the parents I interviewed had a 10-year-old daughter a number of years ago who wanted to go to the movie Mean Girls, and Holly, the mother, didn't want her daughter to go. And they had this uh, disagreement, and finally Holly said, okay, you, you, it's okay if you go uh, to Leah, but I um, want to agree on some questions that you'll have in your mind when you see the movie. Like, who are the mean girls? How do they treat other people? Would you want to know them? Would you like them or not? And they went, through, they worked out this little list of questions, and then Talia came home and they had this wonderful conversation about, you know, her reflections on the mean girls, who she didn't like at all, and how they acted. And um, that's just kind of an example of us getting involved. Research is very positive about this, like the more we get involved with what the kids are actually watching in terms of content, the less impact the content has on them. We have to kind of push our way in because they're, they're just kind of doing it all on their own. But, you know, can you tell me about that? What do you like about it? What's your favorite show? Can I watch it with you? Um, I know it's time intensive, but um, it doesn't have to be. I mean, it, you can maybe in the beginning. But so that it's not a private thing that just goes on for them apart from us. Um, hopefully, um, we can encourage play in any, um, any aspects of kids' lives, pro providing a time and a place for them to play every day, encouraging them to play with other kids, to play with open-ended materials, blocks and clay and paints and collage. And children play all through childhood. It's not just in the early years. These are three of my grandkids when we took a family walk on a beach. Now, we, they ran way ahead, and we showed up, and that's how they looked. <laughs> and there was no one there. So how did they do it? How do, I don't have any idea how they did it. But they're, you know, they're 10, 11, and 12, and they're, um, they're playing in their own way. Actually, this beautiful human theme of kind of hiding and finding and hiding and finding that we all do through life. But little kids start playing like that when they're very young, when they play hide and go seek. <laughs> um, and um, to hopefully get involved in what's happening in education in the country, whatever ways that you can, where that's relevant for you in your own community. There are things happening all over the country with United Opt Out, parents organizing and not engaging in testing or taking their kids out of testing. United Opt Out's an organization you can look into on the web. There are things happening here in Massachusetts. And um, even on a smaller scale, I think you can if you have a school board or you have a school community, really raise issues right there to, to get um, into dialogue. And also, given everything I've said about the influences on children these days, um, I think it's really, um, really at the forefront of our um, goals to try to make them aware of their feelings, of their emotions, of their social interactions, of the effects they have on other people. And that ideally we would use our, our interactions with them and the conflicts they have as opportunities to try to teach them some new awareness and some new skill. I have a little two-minute video that just shows a wonderful teacher doing that very thing with really little kids. It's a model you could use with any age um, there's some writing that comes up on the screen you can ignore because I just want you to see this interaction. Hopefully, it's going to work. We tested it earlier. Yeah, good. Oh, sorry. What's going on? Oh, suéltala. 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 Okay. No, no, no. Un momento. Un momento. Calmate un poquito. Hold on, sweetie. Let's see what's going on. You're both very upset. Don't be in the house. I want the keys for her hand. You cause... want the keys for her hand? Yeah, that was Tommy. Oh, that was Tommy's. Let's see, Tommy. You wanted the keys? Tu 
lo estabas usando? ¿Sí? Este estaba haciendo así. Tú lo estabas haciendo así. You go like that, Chara. Now they said que no le gusta que tú le hagas así. She doesn't like it that you do that. Tommy said que no le dé. Not take it him. He said he doesn't like that. Okay, can I have the keys for a minute, please? Dame la llave. Tú quieres la llave y ella quiere la llave. So, ¿qué vamos a hacer? We both want the keys, so what are we going to do? Porque yo no quiero ese. Tú quieres este. You really want this. Yeah. Tommy dice que él quiere. Yo lo voy a aguantar. Tommy dice que él lo quiere. He really wants this key. He can use yours. Tommy can use your keys. Sí, pues, pues se acabó la ella, pues se acabó. ¿Qué se acabó? What finished? El, el, el de ella se acabó ya. Her keys finished? Uh -huh. Oh. Uh, he, he could use his. Who, he can use his? Yeah. But Natalie says, Natalie, ¿tú todavía quieres esto, verdad? Natalie says she wants these keys. Yo lo voy a aguantar. I'm going to hold on to them, okay? ¿Qué podemos hacer? He could use yours, but he can't have it. He, Tommy, ella dice que tú puedes usar lo de ella. You can use hers. Is that okay? Can, ¿Podemos darle esto para a Natalie? Can we give this back to Natalie? Yes? See? Okay. There you go. So what did you see him do? He acknowledges feelings. He states the problem. What? He states the problem. He, he, he states the problem and, and he reflects what each person says. Anything else? He didn't offer a solution. He didn't give a solution. He let them actually figure it out and he supported them along the way. I think we offer solutions to our kids all the time. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do. This, this approach that I'm talking about is um, it's really calling on us to um, open up some of our basic interactions in a different kind of a way. It's very common um, for parents to use a lot of authority, um, more extreme authority, like putting kids in time out or punishing them or using rewards. A lot of the parents I interviewed for my book would say, you know, um, my son's my 10-year-old son, I, if he's mean to his brother, I take PlayStation minutes away. It's, um, it's a really common, it's kind of what I was saying earlier, you know, using technology or rewards and punishments to, to get a, a quick result. But there's really short-term and long-term gains when it comes to moral development. And the moral development theorists, Piaget and others, made a really strong point in saying the more we use our authority, over children, the less they learn to regulate themselves from within. There, there's really a reciprocal relationship there. So how do we use our adult power to, um, of course, stay in the uh, position of authority? I mean, we have to be the adult in that uh, children would feel unsafe if they didn't feel like we were there to take care of them. But how do we guide them in ways that include them in making decisions um, that help them develop social and emotional skills. I think that's one of our biggest challenges today. A mom told me um, recently that um, she was very proud. She said that um, she and her daughter, Olivia, who was 13, were going to go to dinner with Grandpa. So Olivia came down, showed up in a little miniskirt. So the mother said to me, so I put my foot down and I said, you are not going to dinner with Grandpa in that skirt. And Olivia said, okay, and she went in her room and closed the door. And she didn't go. And that's the very thing we're trying to avoid. In other words, adversarial win-lose kinds of relationships with our kids, and especially teens, but all, the way, all ages. What could she have done instead? If, 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 if you think about that model we just saw, that wonderful teacher, um, you know, would there have been a way to say, oh, wow, you know, uh, Olivia, I, I love that skirt, but I'm thinking, I'm wondering about Grandpa, because he is uh, so used to, um, you know, the longer skirts that Grandma always wore, and he's used to <laughs> longer, and I'm wondering, like, do you think, what could we do here so that we wouldn't surprise him with the real short skirt? <laughs> so that, 
there's some kind of a problem-solving process and we're using a we, what can we do? Rather than if you, the sort of threatening, if you wear that, you're not going. So um, that's, our, that's our challenge, I think, at this point, that one of the most, what I feel like is the um, most hopeful um, things about living in these, what I think are very challenging times for parents, for teachers, um, is to um, look at ourselves and our families and our communities and find all the places where we really can make changes that are going to influence the lives of, um, of the kids who we connect with. So. so how about, you were very quiet during that talk, you didn't raise your hands at all, but can, I ha can we have a few comments or questions? <gasps> Don't tell me there aren't any. Yeah, oh, good, thanks. Hey, uh, could you speak a little, um, as far as your opinion, uh, opinion on the increased use of technology in the classroom? Yeah. Um, I basically, uh, some people make an argument that children have to learn to use technology early. But I, there isn't really any evidence of that. It seems like whatever age they learn it, they're learning it in five seconds. Um, I do not think it's a good idea to use technology in early childhood classrooms at all. And I wouldn't introduce it into classrooms probably until middle elementary school. And then, very thoughtfully, um, certainly kids start using word processing and they start doing research. Um, and a teacher might choose to show an isolated um, maybe if you're talking about polar bears in a second grade, a teacher might make a choice to show a five or ten minute video on polar bears and something very selective like that. But if you're talking about an everyday pervasive use of technology, I'm, I'm very concerned that it's replacing the kinds of experiences kids need to have direct experiences. And because they're having so much screen time outside of school, I think the charge is really to have more direct experience inside of school. Um, so, yeah, anybody else? Also, with, with all the new testing happening, um, it's very unfortunate because the tests that are, um, the PARC and other tests that are connected to the Common Core Standards that are being implemented in almost every state are, are, are technology-based online um, tests. So there's a few issues. One is poor communities are dumping what little money they had into getting the software and the computers to be able to take the tests. That's really, really abysmal. And also younger and younger kids are being taught to, to mouse and use keyboards so that they're prepared to take the tests. So all of, all of these trends, as far as I'm concerned, are, are really harmful. Yes? So that's a bit of a confession. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I read an article recently about um, reading digitally to your children. Yeah. So I don't so much use, I mean, my children have been exposed to the kind of, you know, learn to read with the computer, but it's not really that. It's just they got into a real series where they wanted the next book and the next book and the next book, and how much easier is it for me to get it on my Kindle than to be running to the library every two days? I was just wondering if there's any research or any comments that, um, that you know about. You know what? I saw some research the other day about this, and I forgot what it is. But it wasn't good. It, it, was, <laughs> it actually said there was something uh, more valuable about holding the book. Can you think about that? Like, what would it be? Um, we can find this. We'll all go look it up online, because there is a study. What? Yeah, um, it doesn't have to be either or, too, but I think children's books are, um, oh, I know what's coming to my mind. How old are your kids? Uh, it, well, it's 6 and 11. The 11-year-old's mostly reading herself. So okay. Um, well, some of the things coming to my mind in terms of understanding the, um, the process of, of learning to read totally involves having a book in your hand because some of the emergent literacy skills involve... Um, knowing that you read left to right, knowing that the book has a front and a back, turning the pages, understanding that the story is consistent, and on each page it's the same consistent story each time you read it. These are kind of the, the fundamental pre-literacy skills that would go into early reading. So I would definitely think, I have to look up that study, I think it was something like this, 
but um, I think it wouldn't be as good, it wouldn't be as helpful to young children to develop early literacy skills using a Kindle. Once kids are already reading, then, you know, you would ask, I think, maybe some of the aesthetic questions. I got a Kindle recently because I travel so much, and I have a hard time with it because I, I've read books all my life, so I like how they feel, and I keep looking back at the earlier characters, and there's just something about the whole sensory experience for me um, with a book. But that, that's personal. Um, so we have to look more into this. But I would say, at least for the younger children, actual books have a value for learning to read. Yes? Emma's board members here, and uh, so we're a constantly personal struggle is the MCAS testing myself, and how our school does, because it's so easy to go online and compare yourself to the neighboring towns. And I'm guessing from your message, you're anti standardized testing? I am. I, I think it's very unfortunate. I'm very in favor of um, a qualitative assessments and having really good assessments that, um, that, that help children improve their work and reflect on their work and that inform a teacher about how to do better teaching and learning with individual children. Yeah. If it's not the NCAS, what are you doing? You mean what, what are... Well, I, I, I'm not sure that's true, because I think the, the, MK, the standardized tests tell you very little. It's one measure. That's one very unfortunate thing, is that it's being way overstressed and overused as a way to evaluate a school. It doesn't tell you anything about the arts program, or um, how the music program, or civics, or citizenship experiences, or a social emotional learning going on in the school. It's very, very restrictive. And then, of course, teachers are teaching to the test to try to get the scores up so that the broader curriculum has diminished pretty much all the way ac all across the country. It's very unfortunate, I think, that, um, that testing has had the effect on school curriculum that it's had. There's a new film. It's being shown around in communities. And, um, and I hope you'll look for it. It's called Good Morning Mission Hill. Has anybody heard of it? It's been shown in a few places already. And what's good, it's a Boston public school. And um, I think it's Good Morning Mission Hill. I'm almost positive that's the name. But it's Mission Hill School. In, uh, it's a school that Deborah Meyer, the very well-known educator, started in Boston. But it's a public school. And one of the most helpful things about it is it's showing you how they do all qualitative assessments there. They don't do standardized tests. They, and you can see how profoundly informative for the students and the teachers the qualitative assessments are. They're very serious. They're not anything like spending, you know, just filling out bubbles. It's much more demanding, but it's very connected to the curriculum, so it's very meaningful to the whole education community. But if you get a chance in your community to see that film or you see it anywhere, it might be coming on PBS, please watch it. I think it would be eye-opening. It's more enlightening than my trying to describe what that actually could look like. Yeah? Um, you talked about reading online. I was curious if there are any studies about kids and creative writing in terms of writing in front of the screen versus on paper or what age that may or may not make a difference. Um, I haven't read anything about that. I was just curious what your thoughts. It just, you know, in the schools now, you know, Google Docs and things like that become a great way for the teacher to give immediate feedback to kids because they can see the work in its early stages and see the progression and see how the kids develop. But I'm just curious if there's any harm to the kid in terms of ability to make creative content and become a creative um, contributor. Yeah. Again, I think during the, during the many years in the early childhood years when children are becoming writers, learning how to write and learning about the print system through writing, um, as well as reading, but through writing in this case, um, that um, you, you could bypass some of those important developmental progressions if you got onto a computer and it, it actually was showing you the right way that something is written. Because when you look at developmentally how children learn to write, there's a whole process for coming into using conventional writing that goes on for quite a few years. And I would be very cautious until I saw a lot more research about how showing them um, uh, on a screen 
how to write or the right way to write could impact that developmental process. Yeah. Again, so we don't we just don't have nearly enough research to be able to be making the decisions we need to make responsibly for our kids and yet the stuff's all getting used. And there yes. I feel very sad to say this but I think the technology invasion is um, is going to take forward. How many people think that's true? I couldn't understand. Oh that he's saying, I'm sorry, he's saying that, um, that tech, it's sad to say, but that technology is probably taking over, basically a short way of saying it. Um, I've cer certainly many people think that and think that we are, we are becoming, you know, more techno-human and that, you know, chips will end up inside our heads and we'll be... Um, not the kinds of human creatures we know ourselves to be now, and, and maybe that will happen. I don't know if that's true. Why did I come here even? <laughs> now, I actually would like to uh, keep raising these issues and helping people um, reflect on how this incredibly powerful influence is impacting us, although, um, you know, we, we don't have a crystal ball, so we just don't know. Three what? Virtual schools, so online. Yes, yes. So I'm curious, A, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, that was really concerning to me in my, in my own job. I do a lot with um, developing play skills and social skills in kids, which should be all hands on. And I, I see that these three schools are now all online. Yeah. Yeah, if you, um, first of all, online schools are increasing across the country. The, the biggest company that pushes them is called K-12. They're for profit. They make lots of profit because they get the amount of money per child who just sits at home in front of a computer. So one teacher can just be, you know, working with 100 kids or something and they're just giving them um, stuff on the computer to do at home. So there's a lot of money to be made and there is money being made uh, very much by the private companies that are pushing um, online um, online schools. Yeah, there are three in Massachusetts now. You know, from my point of view, the question is, what is the purpose of school? And is it just to learn to read and to write, or is it to learn citizenship? Is it to learn social and emotional, um, you know, interaction? Is it to learn to be part of a community, to learn about diversity? All the things that, um, that a school community can offer um, that goes way beyond just um, you know learning basic skills. So I I wouldn't. I mean sometimes I think oh maybe I can imagine uh, a situation where a child is completely school phobic or a child has tremendous special needs or something. But even in those cases, I'd rather find alternative ways for that child to be in community with other students and teachers. So. I'll be here if anybody has another question you didn't get to ask, please come up. And I enjoyed very much talking with you. I hope it was a fruitful night for you. Thanks for coming.